Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are having a lovely day. Um, we've been having a look at some of your videos and things for Mary Poppins. They are just looking fabulous. And I know that that end result, although it's not the one that we planned originally, is going to be absolutely brilliant. So we are now on to chapter 37 of the London Eye Mystery. In the last one, we found out that Ted had clocked it and they should have listened to him all along. And he'd worked out that Marcus had helped him switch whilst they were in the pod. But we've also found out that obviously, although he ran away intentionally, something has gone quite wrong. And they're hopefully trying to figure out, well, what's happened then if he ran away? Where on earth is he? So we are on chapter 37 and it's called Salem Supreme. Aunt Gloria loomed over Marcus in her dressing gown like a force 10 gale. What do you know, Marcus? Where's Salem? She grabbed Marcus's sleeve. Say something. Say something. Speak. Detective Inspector Pierce led, led her back to her chair. Mum brought Marcus a drink of lemonade and led him to another chair, but he refused to sit down or take the drink. He shook his head and his hood fell back. Then he wiped his face on his sleeve and looked up and stared at me. I remember to lift up my lips, which Mr Shepherd says to do when you meet somebody new, because it means you can be their friend. But Marcus's lips didn't move, which means he didn't want to be my friend. Marcus is here to say sorry, Detective Inspector Pierce said. He was just too frightened to come forward earlier. He thought he'd get into trouble. Now he's told us what he knows. I have here the statement he made earlier. And his story starts out just as Ted worked out. She nodded at Cat. With Cat's help, I understand. My help, said Cat. I'd never have worked it out without you, Cat, I said. Detective Inspector Pierce continued. Marcus's mum is outside in a squad car with another officer waiting. She wanted you to hear his story too. And then when he's done, she'll take him home. But I don't understand. Rashid squeezed his knuckles into his head. Marcus and Salem spent several hours together the day Salem disappeared. Didn't you, Marcus? Marcus nodded. By arrangement, then Marcus went back to Manchester on his own. Salem didn't. But he was supposed to, wasn't he, Marcus? Marcus nodded again. You see, Salem had planned to run away. No! Aunt Gloria moaned, putting her head in her hands. But he didn't. Not in the end. He changed his mind. Aunt Gloria looked up. He changed his mind, she said softly. She nodded. That's right. He changed his mind. Do you want to explain, Marcus? Detective Inspector Pierce asked. Or would you rather I read out his statement? Read out your statement? There was a pause. Marcus put his hood back up so his face was hidden again. A voice you could hardly hear said, the statement, miss. So Detective Inspector Pierce read out Marcus's statement. And this is what it said. Police, state, police transcript of statement made by witness Marcus Flood. My name is Marcus Flood and this is the truth. Salem is my best mate because he joined my school last September and they called me Packy Boy, which I really didn't like because it sounds racist, but now they don't call me that. And I'm not from Pakistan. My mum's from Bangladesh and my dad's Irish, but that didn't stop Jason Smart grabbing my sandwiches every day and saying, what's the curried goat like today? And then throwing them on the floor, even though they were just cheese and tomato. Then Salem joined my class and sat next to me. They called him Packy Boy number two, which we both hated. He didn't take any notice though. And when Jason Smart grabbed his sandwiches and threw them on the floor, saying they smelled worse than a yak's bum, the next day, Jason Smart opened his own sandwich box and there were thousands of maggots heaving in it. The whole class was in fits of laughter. Salem went from being called Packy Boy number two to Mother Salim Supreme. And since I was his friend, we were moshers together. We had our shirts half tucked in, half tucked out. The top moshers of 9K. When you're a mosher, you're not, supposed to be, you're not supposed to be keen. You sit at the back of the class and look dead bored, but with drama, it was different. We were the mosher keeners because Mr. Davison was so cool. 
He chose us to star in the school play at Easter, The Tempest. Mr. Davison played Prospero. Salem was Ferdinand and I was Miranda. Ha <laughs> ha, the girl. My voice hadn't broken then. I had a long, dark wig to wear and a white dress and every time I said I was certainly a maid, the whole class cheered and stamped their feet and I'd roll my eyes and everybody went, ooh la la. Mr. Davison said I was a comic genius. Then, after Easter, Salem came back to school with bad news. His mum was moving to New York and taking him with her. I was gutted. I sat in science and technology thinking how I'd pinch some chemicals and swallow them whole because I couldn't stand the thought of going back to being called Packy Boy. And just, I'm just going to stop there because I've said it a few times now. And that as a, as a nickname is not okay. And that as a, um, an insult is not okay. And even when I'm reading that, I kind of, my toes are curling and it makes me really, really cringe. It's an old, it's a term from years ago that was used to be um, unkind and derogatory about people from Pakistan. But it's been used now and even now to be disrespectful to people of colour. So the fact that they're saying in this book, I just need to make it really, really clear that I am not OK saying it. And I'm saying it because it's in the book. And obviously the author has used it so that you feel really uncomfortable. But we just need to be really clear that it's never a phrase that we use and that it's in the book to show how unkind the children are to the boys. It's not in there as a as a good thing that we want to take on board. So I just wanted to, to say that because it makes me feel really bleh when I when I have to say it. So Salem didn't want to go either. He asked his dad if he could go and live with him, but his dad said no. Then his mum bought the tickets. They were to fly out from London so that she and Salem could visit these relations that he'd never seen in years called the Sparks. Salem said the, the Sparks could burn in hell. I said at least he'd get to fly the London Eye, which was something we'd always dreamed of doing together. But Sailing said flying it without me wouldn't be any fun. And that's when we came up with the big idea. We'd meet up, me and my Miranda disguise, and we'd ride the London Eye together. Then we'd take the disguise and vanish together and run off somewhere, leaving his mum and the Sparks behind. We'd get a train back to Manchester together. Later that day, and he'd hide out somewhere and I'd bring him food. And when his mum's flight had taken off to New York without him, He'd go and live with his dad and his dad would have no choice but to say yes. Then he and I could go on being the top moshers of 9K. The first thing I did was ring Christy, my big brother. Christy. Chris is down in London and he's always calling to ask for money and dad tells him he's not a bottomless pit and to get lost. This time I rang him. I said if he met me at the London Eye and helped me and my mate Salem carry out this joke we were planning, we'd give him a tenner and he said yes. Salem went down to London with his mum on Sunday. The next day I told my mum I was off out for the day with the scouts and she believed me and he even gave me some money. Plus Salem had, had given me his savings, so I had more than enough to buy two London Eye tickets. Then I hopped on an early train to London and didn't pay a penny because there's this truck, there's this trick I know to dodge the ticket collectors. I got off at Euston Station and found my way down to the river and there was the London Eye. You couldn't miss it. Christy showed up first. I put on the wig I'd worn as Miranda and these slick sunglasses I bought in the Costa del Sol last summer, plus a jacket I'd pinched from Shannon, my older sister. Christy roared his head off and said that I looked crazy and Dad would skin me alive if he could see me. We bought two tickets. I didn't tell him that Salem was going to run away and I was going to hide him. I said we were playing a joke on Salem's cousins, the Sparks. My voice had broken since being in the play. No way could I go up to these spark cousins myself. You'd have spotted I wasn't a girl the moment I opened my mouth. That's why we needed Christy. Plus he was an adult and nobody would ask any questions when we bought the tickets. We'd got the tickets. I called Salem to see where he was. Hurry up, I said. We're boarding at 11.30. He said he was just coming over the river and minutes later he arrived. The mums went off for coffee, just as we'd planned, and Salem and the two Spark cousins joined the ticket queue. Christy went over, pretending to be a stranger, although he'd met Salem once before. He gave Salem the ticket and showed him his place in the queue, and then he dashed off to work because he was running late. I nearly died laughing, pretending not to know Salem. I would to bite my cheek all the way to the ramp and still Salem didn't look at me, not until we were on the wheel itself. 
Then the capsule doors closed and we went up and we split our sides laughing. It was magic, air and light and miles above London, all to ourselves. We were so happy. Then we got to the top. Then when we got to the top, Salem went quiet. He was looking straight at the sun. Salem, I said, what are you staring at? Manhattan, he said. It's London, I said, not Manhattan. It's my fate, Marcus, I've got to face it. I was sad then. It sounded like he'd changed his mind about swapping identities, disappearing and coming back with me to Manchester to hide. But when everyone turned to get the photo taken, he laughed and took the wig off my head and stuck it on his. I took, the ja I took off the jacket, he put it on. I straightened the wig, popped on the sunglasses. It took seconds. Nobody saw us. They were all looking the other way for their souvenir photo. Then the pod landed. We walked out right under the noses of the Spark Cousins and you should have seen their freaked out faces. Salem put on this fancy walk just like a girl and next he cruised past where his mum was sitting having coffee and she looked straight at him and didn't recognise him. I dragged him off before she noticed me and we disappeared into the crowd. He got his mobile phone out and turned it off. The day is ours, Marcus, he shouted. He thumped me on the back and took off the wig. He left his camera behind with one of the cousins. But between us, we still had some money. So he bought a disposable camera at a chemist and snapped one of me on the bridge. And then he bought hot dogs and Mars bars and Cokes. And we picnicked in the park by the river. And I pretended to be a duck squawking. And Salem said I was a comic genius. Then we went to the square where all the buskers perform. And they were dead funny. A juggler on stilts with a tear in his pants. A magician with a silver globe that rolled along rolled over his body. A clown that did ten somersaults and landed on his nose. After the show, Salem gave the clown his last pound. We walked up Tottenham Court Road and found this shop that sells electric pianos. You could do organ strings, trumpets and drum beats all at once. It was great. The best day I've ever had. I wanted it to last forever, but it didn't. We got to Euston Station. That's when Salem told me he wasn't coming with me. I can't, Marcus, he said. You can. It's easy. You hop on and hide in the bog. It's not that. I can't run away. Not from my mum. She's some mum, my mum. But she's the only mum I've got. And it's not just her. It's the cousins, Ted and Cat. The Sparks? Thought you said you couldn't care less about them. Well, that was before I met them again. They're great, Cat and Ted. If I don't go back, they'll get into so much trouble for letting me go on the eye by myself and mum will be frantic. I didn't know what to say. People rushed by, dashing for trains. Announcements droned on. I heard one for Manchester, my train. You're just a mosher wannabe, I said. Yeah, you're the real mosher, Marcus. I'm not in your league, he smiled. You did the maggots, didn't you? How do you know? When I was round your house last, your dad, dad told me about this hobby, fishing. Then he gave me back Shannon's pink fluffy jacket and I put it on my backpack along with the wig. But I made him keep the sunglasses. They looked good on him. A whistle blew. It was my train. We said goodbye and he hugged. Run, Marcus. I'll send you a card from the Empire State Building. So I ran. Doors were slamming and I heard him shout after me. Don't let them call you Packy Boy. You're Mosha Marcus. Remember, you're a comic genius. A guard saw me and shouted. I jumped on the train. I only just made it before they locked the doors. I saw Salem waving as the train pulled out. And that was the last time I saw him. I hid in the toilet until after Stoke-on-Trent at Manchester. I got off without getting caught and went home. How was the scouts? Mum asked. Fantastic, I said. Later that night, when I was sneaking Shannon's pink jacket back into her wardrobe, I found Salem's mobile phone in the pocket. He'd left it behind, just like he'd left his camera with the cousins. I'd mail it to him when he got to New York, I thought, and put it in my desk drawer. The next day, the police came. They said Salem had gone missing. Mum, wasn't, mum was there. If I'd admitted to having been with Salem the day before, she'd have been livid. So I stuck to the scout story. But after the police left, I started worrying. Where was Salem? Why hadn't he gone back to the Sparks house like he'd said? I tossed and turned all night. Then today, I couldn't take it anymore. 
I took out his phone, meaning to call his mum and tell her what I did. So I did. I turned it on. There were about 20 voicemail messages waiting, all from her, and she sounded terrible. I put through a call, but it rang and rang. Then she answered, and I realised I couldn't face talking to her. I hung up and switched the phone off again. I hid it under my mattress. Then later, Christy rang me on my mobile. He said Salem's cousins had bumped into him at this mo motorbike show where he's working. He hadn't given me away, but if I knew where Salem was, I'd better go straight to the police and leave him out of it. He shouted his head off. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't go to the police. I'd get into trouble. Then tonight, the police showed up and they knew everything. Salem's cousin Ted had worked it out, they said. They said how it had been with the wig and the eye and jumping on the train. It was like Ted Spark had been in my head, seeing my thoughts. And I remember Salem saying how he had some weird syndrome that made him think like a giant computer. So this is the truth and nothing but the truth. I last saw Salem at Euston train station and this is all I know. I think we're gonna have to leave it there. That was quite a long chapter. But we're now at 88% of the book, which makes me think that you may well finish it tomorrow with Mrs. Brazier, and if not, definitely on Wednesday with Mrs. Woodward. So tomorrow then, hopefully you'll find out where um, Salem, couldn't think of his name then, where Salem is, um, what's happened to him, hopefully he's okay. Um, as I say, we are very, very close to the end. I will speak to you soon. Take care.